Okay, welcome back. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, and putting together this, this really nice workshop. It's nice to have such a concentrated event on, on this interesting material and related materials. Um, somebody asked me recently, you know, what's this conference about Sumerian Arts of War? And what, how could you have one workshop on one material? Wow. Well, um, so I'm going to talk mainly today about uh, some results we, we, we started getting actually some time ago, but uh, I'll give you some recent developments um, about uh, observations of uh, surface ferromagnetism and the resultant effect on transport properties at low temperatures. Um, just to start with, I'll just acknowledge uh, the people in my group, and particularly the ones involved in these experiments. So these two guys are here today actually, Yasuyuki and Cheng Feng. Uh, Yasuki has been uh, leading the, the dilution bridge experimental effort, and Cheng Feng has been leading the, the synthesis effort of the Samaritan Sephora and, and many other materials for that matter. And then a uh, recent graduate from my group, Paul Sires, did some other experiments that all flash as well. And there's many uh, collaborators that we're providing crystals to and working together with and so on. If your name's not here, I apologize. I put this slide as usual, put it together at the very end. Okay, so uh, I assume we've, I missed this morning's talks, but I assume we had some introduction to this material. I always like to show the historical context though, back to Ted Jabal's uh, very interesting observation of insulating behavior in this material, the first report of semiconducting behavior. And not shown in the data, but actually in the text, the, uh, this observation of the saturation of resistivity at low temperatures. So that's the first report, and that's 1969, older than I am, so that's, it's wonderful to be working on this very interesting material um, <clears throat> that's discovered before I was born. Okay. Okay. Um, and then subsequent experiments, there's a long history, of course, and we'll hear more and more about that as we go on in this workshop, about uh, subsequent experiments that essentially were trying to prove or disprove the the insulating nature of this compound, right? Whether it was really a condo insulator, as it was called, um, or it was just a dirty metal and so on. There's a long history of that. Um, jump to 2010 um, with this very interesting prediction of uh, essentially the basic idea of having a, uh, a band gap in the material, whether it comes from correlations or not, uh, tied together with some band inversion that gives you some interesting non-trivial topology. And you put these two together and with some details, you have this prediction of having a topological insulator. So that, uh, of course, prompted many people to work in this field, including ourselves. Uh, and I was very excited because I'm an F-electron guy, a uh, heavy fermion guy. So I was very interested to jump back into this kind of research and also work on something that's uh, somewhat uh, cutting edge. Okay, uh, I'm just going to flash essentially one, one uh, fairly recent result, which is, a, as far as I understand, pretty good evidence of some topological aspect of the surface states in this material, and that's the observation of the spin texture in the ceramic support. There's many ARPA's experiments, and I'm sure there's some ongoing ones, so I don't want to discredit or credit anyone, I just think this is an interesting result. Um, this shows some indication that there really is some chiral states on the surface. And uh, that's just to motivate our own work where we also um, will suggest that we have some evidence for some chiral, chiral surface states as a, as a result of transport experiments. So I'll very quickly go through some transport studies just to show that the surface really is metallic, but I think we've already seen even this morning that there's sufficient evidence to, to make that conclusion. And then I'll focus mainly on the uh, observation of some quantized light conductance. And if I have time at the end, I'll talk about some work on uh, iron substitution in some of of ore. Okay, um, just some characterization work to show that the crystals are nice and they're well behaved and the x-ray refinements are as good as I've ever seen coming out of uh, our x-ray labs in Maryland. Um, they're grown in the materials we're working with, like low grown in aluminum flux. Uh, we take the, temp the furnace up to 1,700 degrees. 
uh, and a special sealing so that's not quartz and so on. Uh, and we get these nice crystals out that, that you check on your board film. Okay, um, and then I'll show you some work that we did that's basically an extension of these nice prior results. Uh, looking at ways to prove or disprove the, the existence of this surface metallic state at low temperatures. And so these are nice results showing, for instance, looking at the Hall effects function of thickness on a wedge, um, showing that there's no dependence on the thickness so that you, know, you can prove right away that this is a surface metallic state, or doing some non-local contact geometry. Uh, same idea, you can just show that the, the current is going around the edge, it's not going through the ball. Um, in our own work, we did some uh, straightforward studies of thickness dependence of transport. So just take the same crystal and just make it thinner and thinner and remeasure the resistivity. When you normalize it to higher temperatures where the bulk is dominating the conduction, you can see that there's a very strong thickness dependence of the low temperature conduction. And so that's, that's uh, the main result, just to show that this really is a surface <coughs> conducting state. There's no other way to explain that. Uh, but the other interesting thing is you can now look at this crossover, this, this uh, knee in the data, and study that in some way and show that it's really a crossover. It's not some kind of phase transition, at least according to the transport results. So, um, oh, I don't, oh, I missed the slide, okay. If you, just trust me on, if you plot this cross characteristic crossover temperature, let's say defined by derivative, of resistivity, it actually changes. So you can shift this crossover by changing the relative bulk and surface conduction. So it's a crossover temperature where the surface and bulk are essentially equal in conduction in a given material, given sample, with a given geometry. Um, you can also, uh, what's really nice about the fact that this is surface conduction on, in a crystal is that you can now put a gate device on top of the crystal which you normally do in a thin film or on a substrate. And uh, this is worked together with uh, Michael Fuhrer and his then student, Dohan Kim. Uh, we can tune the states with an ionic liquid gate configuration. And you can see that you actually shift around the surface conducting states just by applying this gate voltage. So it's another confirmation that you, if, the, if there was bulk states contributing at low temperatures, you wouldn't be able to push them around at the surface like this. So that's a, another nice confirmation. It really is a surface metallic state. Uh, okay, and sorry, here is this T star, which we called as the crossover temperature. And you can, from analyzing this data, you can see that it actually just changes and it depends on, in this case, gate voltage. Uh, in the previous case, it's the, just the thickness and the relative crossover point. Okay, another thing that you can pull out of this Corvino uh, experiment with gating voltage is the mobility. And I'm sure uh, many of you are aware of this kind of number. In fact, it was measured uh, in Michigan, a very similar number too. Um, so 100 centimeters squared per volt second is not very big, and this is what people think is the reason why quantum oscillations are very hard to see, at least in transport measurements. So um, it is what it is. Okay, so on to uh, the low temperature transport data. Uh, so this is a series of experiments where we're lo looking at magneto resistance up to 15 tesla uh, between our base temperature of the fridge, 20 millikelvin, up to one kelvin, where basically uh, things kind of saturate after that. What we find is very interesting behavior below about half a kelvin. And so what we, it, it took us a little while to determine that there was a field history dependence to this, this magneto resistance data. So for instance, sweeping the magnetic field up and then sweeping the magnetic field down gives you different data points. And so you can see it even qualitatively here just by seeing that there's a bit of a wiggle in this data on the upsweep and it's kind of gone in the downsweep here. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Also, you, if you note down here, there's some of these little transitions here that seem to not be there on the upsweeps. So that's this sort of data set that we've been analyzing for roughly two years now uh, in many samples. So I'll start to show you some key features and go through this story piece by piece. So if you put the upsweep and downsweep data together, that's this data here, and we've gone from zero to plus field, and then back to 
blue is going down, and then we go crossing zero, going to minus field in our, in our magnet, and back again. You can see this hysteretic behavior where there's a big lobe here that opens up and then it closes in a very strange way in a sort of transition-like fashion before you get back to zero field. So it's ferromagnetic-like in that hysteresis is typically uh, uh, a ferromagnetic effect. It can be due to some first order transition, of course, but uh, this kind of transport uh, hysteresis is typically seen in a ferromagnet. Um, what's not the same as, as the ferromagnetic case is that there's no overshoot. So it seems like this thing wants to overshoot, but before it gets to zero, it somehow reverts back to the virgin curve. So uh, it's a hysteresis, nevertheless. Um, this phase transition is very sharp. It's always around one tesla in the samples that we do see it in. It's always there in samples where we see hysteresis. So in some samples, we don't see any hysteresis in the course. When we see hysteresis, the transition is there. Um, and I'll, I'll say right off the bat that we just don't understand what this phase transition is. We're trying to investigate it. Um, but it takes a lot of preparations. You can see you have to sweep up the field, slowly sweep down, and study it in various ways. The sweep order of the scattering is the, is the third interesting point. If you notice, this is resistance, and the upsweep resistance is lower than the downsweep resistance. So that's unusual, because in a ferro magnet, typically, the conductance is higher on downsweep. And that's because you have uh, you have less minority domains, less domain scattering. Or in simple terms, you, you crank the field up, you polarize everything, there's less spin scattering when you reduce the field back down. So typically, it's flipped the other way. Here, we see something that's unusual. Uh, luckily, there's been other work in TI systems, in particular, this uh, manganese-doped bismuth tellurium selenium system, where they've studied this in detail. and. In this case, they're, they're fortunate to be able to actually make a thin film and be able to gate tune it from the bulk states into the TI states, well-characterized TI states, and actually see this reversal. So here's the typical butterfly shape of, of conduct conductivity in this case. And when they tune the system into the TI state, surface-only states in the gap, uh, this reverses. So it's the same order as what we see. When you increase the field, the resistance is lower than when you decrease the field, uh, which is opposite to the typical case for ferromagnet. So there's a story behind uh, this result, and they, they, they claim that this is due to the chiral edge states, basically reversing this effect of the spin flip scattering. And so we believe there's something similar going on in the Sumerian Explorer. OK, um, the last thing in this list is the anisotropy in this effect. So. So when we, all these experiments I've shown you so far are with the magnetic field perpendicular to the measurement plane of the, the plate-like crystal. When we tilt the field into the plane, we see this effect go away. So you can see that hysteresis is here, it's not here. At the same time, we also see at very low fields, so note the field scale here is 15 tesla, at very low fields of less than 100 millitesla or so, uh, we see some peak feature, it's very weak here, but you see more prominent here, and this is a weak anti-localization uh, like peak in the conductance. Okay. That also has an anisotropy. We've seen this in several samples. And it seems to be opposite. So when the hysteresis is here, this weak anti-localization is very weak uh, in amplitude. And vice versa, when there's no hysteresis, when we tilt the field into the plane, the weak anti-localization somehow sort of gets bigger or it reappears. So if you think about this carefully, it, it makes sense in terms of spin-flip scattering. So if you have a ferromagnetic state, you naturally have spin, stronger spin-flip scattering. And that would be the case in this orientation. And therefore, the weak anti-localization is, is weakened. And it should go towards actual weak localization in a stronger limit. And when you weaken the ferromagnetic state, you weaken the, the spin-flip scattering. And this reappears. So at the very least, this is consistent with this picture of ferromagnetism. OK, so if you're not convinced about ferromagnetism yet, we'll, I'll show you a couple more data sets. 
Uh, one in particular, which we hunted for for a long time, it was hard to find, but it's actually there, is anomalous Hall effect. So if you have a ferromagnetic state, you should see anomalous Hall effect. Um, here's the transverse resistance or Hall data, this function magnetic field at one Kelvin, where there's, there's no hysteresis or anything like that. It's just a straight line. It's negative. Um, we've offset it here, I believe, from zero. Um, it's consistent with several other data sets. When you go below the temperature where you start to see this hysteretic effect, you see this kink here. And a simple a subtraction of this high field part, uh, well, okay, we fit the low field part to a straight line and subtract the data from that. And you can see that there's a very well-defined kink there. And this is exactly where the uh, hysteretic behavior onsets. So if you sweep up the field and come back, that's where the low opens up. So this, this we believe is a signature of an anomalous Hall effect. Now, the second thing that's very interesting, and we're still studying this, is some time dependence. So there's some dynamics that we observe in the transport data. So you can see here in the legend that these sweeps take quite a long time, and they're quite expensive. We have to refill the doer once we get up here and then put more helium in it again. So nevertheless, we were doing 12-hour sweeps. We thought, well, maybe there's, we have to be very careful about this. So let's slow down even further and do 30 hours up and 30 hours down. That's basically the limit of our doer before it gets empty. And you can see that there's a slight difference in the data. And same thing here. This is a sample which actually has some positive magnetic resistance. There's a slight difference here. That okay, there's something we have to be careful about here. So let's do an experiment um, where we simply just increase the magnetic field to a certain point, stop and just measure resistance as a function of time. And then we'll go up to high field, reset or polarize the state, come back to the same field, same sample, and measure again. So that's these two data sets. The top part is just showing you that the temperature while we do this doesn't change by more than four or five millikelvin. So don't worry about the top part. The bottom part shows the field profile as a function of time. So this is ramping up to nine tesla and stopping. And you can see there's the resistance here. This is the magneto resistance, the usual magneto resistance. And then stopping here, you see that there's a very long relaxation. This is on the order of one hour kind of time constant. And now the same sample, everything the same. We go up to 15 tesla, go back from 15 back to 9 tesla, and stop again. And so again, we come back to this point, and this relaxation is gone. So I'm sure there's other explanations, but when I talk to my uh, magnetism friends in material science, they say this is ferromagnetism. Okay, so for once, I side with the material scientists. Uh, call it, at least we call it concluded that this is all consistent with a ferromagnetic state. I'd be happy to hear other opinions about this. Um, so this is an interesting dynamics effect which we're happy to, we, we would like to study more but it's very time consuming. Okay, so finally, I uh, hope I've convinced you that there is a good signature of some kind of surface ferromagnetic state. Um, oh, I should say just one more thing about the uh, angle dependence, that this angle dependence, just to remind you, is, is with a cubic crystal. So you're actually breaking the cubic crystal symmetry. So this is another piece of evidence that this is a surface-related effect. Okay. So now, taking that all together, now we look at the temperature dependence of this hysteretic effect. Uh, now I've plotted the same data, but as a function, uh, sorry, as conductance rather than resistance. Just flip it over and uh, plot as a function of the magnetic field. So you can see here is the hysteretic behavior, and as we increase temperature, this goes away by 600 millikelvin, it's gone. And this is fairly consistent in uh, seven or so samples where we do see the hysteresis. It always disappears around 0.5 Kelvin. So where is this coming from? It's a good question. Um, it's Curie temperature is about five or 600 millikelvin, there's some nice theoretical work uh, considering, in particular, Dirac electrons on the surface of a TI system with some magnetic impurities so that you then have some RKKY type interaction. 
uh, mediated by the Dirac electrons, and you can work out the mean field theory and get some theory temperature from that. Just putting in some specifics about the material exchange, um, chemical potential, VF, and so on. So we kind of know these, these numbers. So we can put in this number and get some actual amount of magnetic impurities, which is on the order of a fraction of a percent. So that's not unreasonable. But what is sort of unreasonable to me, at least, is that this, this number, the Curie temperature, doesn't seem to change. So it would be unusual that from sample to sample, where you would expect this number to change somehow, that you don't see the Curie temperature change at all. So I, I'm more in favor of actually uh, just simply an oxide surface, which is experimentally known now, where you have samarium 3 plus, which has a moment, and these are interacting with some conduction electrons and giving you some RTKY interaction. And that, I assume, that would be a more stable configuration to give you a sort of constant Curie temperature. Okay. So here's the conductance. Now we're going to analyze the difference between up and down sweeps and the conductance. You can see right away here that the background conductance is is few hundred e squared over h. So it's by far not quantized. This conductance at low temperatures is many, many channels of quantum of conductance, right? So, um, but on top of that, when you look at this splitting of the up and down sweeps, and you just subtract the two, this is delta G, you can see that this difference actually goes up to something like 1 e squared over H. Um, and this is reproducible. We, bit, we essentially see, I'll show you in a second, we see this in many samples. Um, and you can see now that the temperature uh, diminishes this effect. So as you increase the temperature, this delta G, of course, goes away. Um, and it seems to be peaked around some field, which we just call a coercive field, um, which changes with temperature in some way, uh, which you can track. It kind of looks like an order parameter, basically. Um, so I'll show you some reproducibility in a second, but the main story here uh, is that when we look at this difference in the conductance, it gives us something on the order of e squared over h, which is suggestive of some kind of quantized conductance. So how do you get that in a TI system with magnetic, uh, either magnetic order or magnetic impurities? Well, magnetic order is a time versus symmetry breaking uh, phenomenon. So that should be gapping any kind of Dirac states that you have across any kind of chemical potential. This, this system in particular is a bit complicated in that you have, uh, at least for the 100 surface, three uh, Dirac cones, one in gamma and two at the x and y positions. So you have to consider what's happening in detail. So uh, this is basically just going by what's, known, what's calculated, what's somewhat known for the band structure, <coughs> trying to fit it to our, our results, and saying that we, we gap, we think we gap both Dirac cones. But there's this large le leftover conductance. So it seems that, at least I think most people believe, the Dirac cones are shifted relative to each other at these two high symmetry points. So our speculation is that the chemical potential is still running through the other band, whereas it's actually gapped in the one band. There may be other carriers there too, we just don't know. But what we do see as a result is that this small difference uh, is e squared over h. So it seems to be coming, how do you get e squared over h? You can get it from a chiral edge state. So you form some, some domains of ferromagnetic up and down spin regions. That will gap this particular set of carriers, but along the edges of these two sets of domains, you will allow these states to conduct. So you end up getting one dimensional conduction along this 2D surface, and that should be quantized. So the question is, why isn't it exactly 1 e squared over h? I'll come back to that. Uh, just to show you some reproducibility, here's another sample. Uh, I'm going to show you first, a, this is a sample. And we typically see negative magnetic resistance in all our crystals. Uh, here's another sample where it's, it's negative, and there's some hysteresis. There's the transition there. You see that it's not quite 1, but it's approaching 1. And five minutes. And there are, we've measured many samples with very different background resistance, and this difference always seems to be between 
between 0 and 1. Okay. Here's a sample with positive magnetic resistance, which is more rare in, in, for some reason in the samples that we measured. Here, the hysteresis is very pronounced. I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, again, this, this uh, delta G is of order 1. Here, it seems to approach 2. But notice the temperature. When we cool it down, it actually comes back to 1. So this, again, made us aware of a potential problem in that the, the uh, time dependence of this effect, the dynamics, might be affecting our analysis. So we did a very careful study. I'll come back to this in a second. We did a very careful study where we, again, went to a specific field and just set the field constant, and then did temperature sweeps. This is an even extreme, much more time-consuming process to map out temperature and feel the whole phase space. But here's one example where we went to 9 Tesla again, same field I showed you before, and measured temperature, and then reset and measured temperature again on the downsweep part. And you can see there's a very small but very distinct splitting that appears below about 0.2 Kelvin or so in this, in this particular field. So it's consistent with the other data where there's some opening at some given temperature field. Right? So sort of like a Curie temperature at this field. And you can see now this is delta G plotted as a function of temperature at this given field. right? So it's not necessarily optimized to give you the one. But you can see something very interesting. It opens up and it shoots up to something close to one and then comes back down. So there's some very rich behavior here, which we're not mere cracking. I mean, this is just very time intensive to do all these studies. But it suggests that there, we have to be very careful in temperature and field sweeps, time dynamics, and so on. Um, OK, so one of the last slides here is just to show reproducibility. Here's six samples um, varying in the amount of hysteretic conductance from something very small. Well, we vary from zero, because many samples have seen nothing something much less than one. These are all on the same scale, something around one. And these samples are varying in the background resistance. So it's very reproducible. OK, so why not exactly one? There's several reasons why you could get that. One is inelastic scattering. Okay. Um, that, will, uh, that will reduce you from the quantized of square over h conductance for ballistic transport. Um, one is sort of a real space effect that's very well known in graphene, this so-called puddling, where the, the potential varies from position to position. This can give you some spurious effects. Um, other reason, which is just a very simple blackboard picture, is that you have these domains. We don't know the size of them yet. We're trying to work on that. Uh, but depending on where you put the contacts, you're not necessarily between one or two domains. You could be in a huge, infinite network of domains the question is, if these <laughs> resistors are each h over e squared, then what do you expect for resistance between these two nodes? And it's actually a very classic problem. It's not easy to solve. But the answer is of the order of h over e squared, not exactly h over e squared. You only get h over e squared when you're between two particular nodes. Okay. So uh, I have one minute left. Yeah. Okay. So in the last minute, I will just show you some newer data on the effects of iron substitution uh, because it's quite provocative and so, since we're all experts on sumerian hexaboride, I'd love to hear your opinions. Um, to make a long story short, the uh, samples have roughly a half percent of iron, purposely put in, and we've characterized them to know that the iron really is in there. Okay. Um, the effects on transport are such that when you put iron in them, the low temperature conductance gets greatly reduced, or the resistance goes up. The Hall effect gets increased, so the either the mobility or the carrier concentration goes down. Um, we did thickness dependence studies in the same way as before. Uh, so there is a thickness dependence, so there's still surface carriers, of course, but the effect is greatly diminished compared to the, the pure sample. In fact, it looks like there's some when you go to the limit of zero thickness, there's some residual sort of bulk conductance. So it means that the bulk is no longer negligible. Okay, magneto resistance. Uh, I don't know what to say about it, but I'm happy to show you. Anyone that asks me later, it has a very strong temperature dependence. From two Kelvin, you have a sort of peak.
heat and low feel to four Kelvin where it completely reverses and then it goes to the sort of usual behavior. And then finally, the last slide uh, is some uh, USR data on bulk crystals. And this is comparing the uh, pure ceramic savoy to the iron dope. Lambda is this uh, 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 stretched exponential fit result, basically representative of the electron spin relaxation, uh, relaxation of the muons due to the electron spin. And so you see, this is a this is unusual in itself. This pure sample response, where you have some value of lambda in the iron dope sample, it seems to be completely gone. So either the there's no relaxation effect, or the the, uh, the electron spin relaxation is too fast for the muons to see. So we're actually reproducing this result because it's, it's very strange, and no one seems to understand what's going on. So it's this is a bulk response too. This is a USR. So with that, I'll leave my conclusions and take any further questions. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, is it a pheromone that transitions the other side? Why it seems to be so sharp, even in the field? You mean the... Uh, the only... You mean the downs? Which part is sharp? Do you, uh, do you have measurement of the... Uh, did the temperature dependence at point two there was kind of a step. Yeah. Step. Oh here. This one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't <laughs> call this sharp. I mean it's uh <clears throat> you mean this part here? Yeah, in the inset. So if you had a field, you would think there'd be a crossover. Yeah. I don't know. I mean if I don't have the plot here, but if you even just plot the <coughs> This H, so-called H star, this coercive field, it's just the maximum of this difference. It has a quite sharp onset. It looks like a like a mean field order graph. So the that extracted data is quite sharp. Um, if you believe this is a real phase transition, it should be sharp. I wouldn't say myself that this temperature dependent behavior is sharp just because it's, you know, these points are very close together. You can see this is even negative over here, so you have to be careful about how to take, do this subtraction. And then this changes as you change field and so on. But the answer would be that it's a phase transition. It's just that, you know, the ferromagnet field should then already have broken the symmetry and then there wouldn't be an actual phase transition. So one wonders whether it's right. not. Right. Um, I think you have to you have to consider the domain picture problem. So uh, it's about scattering, right? So populating majority and minority domains may happen in a more abrupt way than than you, than you would think. But we just don't know the size of the domains and so on, how they appear. There's there's no probe that I know of that we can image these things with that happen to all of us. Uh, in the whole data, what behavior does do you expect? Uh, I don't remember. I think it's I think it's consistent with what was shown. I have a better number from the the ionic liquid gating experiment. But that's a more definite number, and that's uh, ten to the fourteen per square centimeter. <laughs> All these uh, surface ferromagnets that uh, you are uh, detecting, it's um, 0, 0, 1 surface, right? Yeah. Uh, so have you checked the like, uh, 0, 1, 1 surface? Is that any difference? Uh, did we check 0, 1, 1? We haven't checked, no. Typically, the crystals give you a larger surface on the yeah. 0, 0, 1. So we just haven't done it yet. Uh, uh, what I would like to do is, or somebody should do, is the, put Corbino the geometry uh, leads on different faces and, and look for this. But the, the problem is we don't know in a given sample whether we're going to see the hysteretic behavior or not. So it's a very uh, strong commitment of time and effort. But yes, we should, yeah, so should look for Suppose uh, this pheromone actually come from some unscreened, uh, some large screen press. 
size. Right. So that should be uh, closely related to if the surface is taller or not. So uh, part yeah, relation to which surface you are looking at. So probably change a, a different surface and you consider would be a good idea. I agree. But related to that, have you tried different treatments of the surface? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've tried uh, polishing. It doesn't seem to be, we can't find any systematic reason why the hysteretic behavior shows up or doesn't, depending on the way we make contacts, the way we prepare the surface. But again, you know, I could say we've studied maybe 15 or 20 samples, 30. And how many of those surfaces? Uh, seven. seven. So first of all, why isn't this a metal magnetic transition instead of paramagnetic transition? And the other is that for these crystals, you need a special, um, do something special in the probes in order to make it paramagnetic. Or... The, second, the second question, we, we don't know of any systematics that give us the hysteresis. We've looked, we've tried different growth methods, we've tried different preparation. I uh, don't seem to find any consistency. Not that there isn't one, it's just that we just need time to study it. Uh, the first question, I'm sorry, was uh, uh, metamagnetic versus... Metamagnetic precision versus paramagnetic. I mean, that's fine. I think what you really need is, a, is, is time reversal symmetry breaking. So I think the important thing is having domains. So you can have, as far as I understand, you can have domains of some kind of a metamagnetic state. Uh, so you kind of have a third question. So you said there's no way you can measure the image of the domain at a Hubble Kelvin. Uh, so we just finished imaging the magnetic domains in cones of your fission satellite. Yeah. Well, uh, you're gonna you're gonna say yeah. yeah. You're gonna tell us that we can't do it. That's at 50 meters. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So what I, I should qualify that statement. What I mean is the typical experiments done to image domains in, in ferromagnets, like uh, Lorentz microscopy and so on, they don't, they won't work below 1K. It's just basically impossible. But your, your method will certainly be interesting. But your uh, re spatial resolution. One micron, so that may Yeah, so if they're smaller than one micron, then you may not see it. But it's definitely worth looking at. <laughs> The, the anomalous form of that data that you showed me, it doesn't resemble the conventional anomalous form of that. Uh, in particular, one would have expected, uh, you know, when you see the step down, uh, that, that would that would give you more of this uh, anomalous form of signal. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it's, we were happy to see anything. <laughs> yeah, but, but figuring it out, yeah. So, yeah. But because mm -hmm. if you see this, uh, whichever part you're associating with the anomalous form of that change sign as you go through zero. Well, this is anti symmetrized. And in fact, there's a there's a hysteresis that has yeah, been subtracted out of this. You want to focus on Yeah, so we've been looking hard to see hysteresis in the, in the hall, and we don't see it. So we thought we saw it, but then when we properly anti-symmetrized, it, it was removed. It was the longitudinal part. So, I mean, the, the problem is that the, the signals are very comparable in size. So. What happens at lower temperature? Uh, you mean below 100? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure we did that. You mean the 
time, uh, time dependence. Well, the transition uh, uh, each house. Okay, right. that there is a hysteresis and there is this this this, this dynamics we see. Yeah, but would it still be there at nine tesla? Well it's it, I mean the hysteresis is there. Yeah, the hysteresis is then your mechanic anatomic Well it's a surface. Um, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, is, can you think of any scenario that can explain this behavior, assuming that the surface is a trivial surface instead of a topological surface? Um, well, the uh, the sign of the diff. Is, I'll, I'll I'll answer it in saying that I'll tell you what doesn't fit that picture. So one is the the reversal of the, the up and down sweep resistance mm -hmm. being more. Uh, more conductive on upsweep, so that's unusual. And the, the quantized conductance being sort of independent of the sample in the sense that it's always around one, it's not 10, it's not five. So that, that I don't understand how you would get from uh, some trivial states. Yeah. Okay, I think it's about time. Thanks, Mika, again.